So I thought I would gather the little pieces together that I've been trying to tell you over the years. Tonight, we will take the opening passage of the Epistle to the Hebrews. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. This Son reflects the glory of God and bears the expressed image of his person. This is the heart of the Christian message. This is the gospel. Spoken in the universal language that all would understand. Whether you be living here in our marvelous land of America or living in any part of the world, we all know the relationship of father-son. So he spoke in many and various ways. As we are told in the 19th Psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. And man has done marvelous things in the study of the heavens and the study of the things of earth. You and I are now benefiting from the things that we have discovered in this search right here on earth. And with the great telescopes, we have discovered numberless beauties of the heaven. And we've gone so far to actually walk on the moon. But all of these things will fade into nothing compared to the final revelation of God. In the last days, he reveals himself by his Son. You will not find God, no matter how you find the things and the wonders of the earth, and we find them day after day. You will not find him if you go to all the heavens of the world. You aren't going to find him there, but you will find him, and everyone in the world will find him in the relationship of father-son. This is God's final revelation of himself to man. And so whether you be living now in Africa, living here in America, living in China, everyone knows this relationship. You could be today without a child, never married in your life, but you know the relationship. You could be female, and still you know the relationship of a father-son. And I will tell you that in this state, when you are above it all, you're neither male nor female. As we are told, male, female, made he then, and called their name man. So in Christ, there is no Greek, there is no Jew, there is no male, no female, no bond, no free. We are above it all, but we all know this relationship. And it will not shock a woman to know that she is God the Father when the time comes for it to be revealed in her, revealed in a man, revealed in anyone in this world. So this is God's final revelation to man, and he reveals it by his Son. Now let me share it with you. In this same book, what is the source I do not know? He tells us that Moses was told to see clearly and make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Make it according to the pattern. So we're living in a world that is only a copy. This is a copy. The reality is not here at all. This is all a copy. Why the author of the letter to the Hebrews stated that the urn, the golden urn, 
that contained the manna, and that the rod that budded, Aaron's rod that budded, was in the Holy of Holies, I do not know. Because I know from experience it isn't so. Now we are told by our historians and our archaeologists that when the temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD and Jerusalem was destroyed, when they opened the Holy of Holies, it was empty. There was nothing there when they opened the Holy of Holies. Why he incorporated this into his story, I do not know. What was his source, I do not know. It is not in the Old Testament. There is not one line in the Old Testament where the rod that budded, Aaron's rod that budded, and the urn that contained manna, the golden urn, was found in any Holy of Holies. And I know from my own experience that that Holy of Holies is right here. And God sleeps in it. And when God awakes without the help of anyone, he doesn't need anyone's help, God emerges from the Holy of Holies, which is called the Holy Sepulchre. And when you awake within that Holy Sepulchre, it is empty, may I tell you. You are the only presence in it. And you come out by your innate wisdom as to what to do. And you push yourself out of it. You push and something gives and you come out. And so the story is true. It is empty. And so if our archaeologists found the temple, and the temple uh, was destroyed, and the Holy of Holies vein opened, was found to be completely empty. So not a thing is in it but the sleeper, and the sleeper in man is God, and his name forever and forever is I Am. That's God. There is no other God. But he is a father. And then in the not distant future, after he comes out, leaving the empty sepulchre, he will know who he is. He still doesn't know who he is when he comes out. It takes his son to reveal him. And the son doesn't even call him. He calls him father, but he doesn't have to call him father. The minute he appears, memory returns. For the thing that God gave up to become man was memory. That was his great sacrifice. He completely gave up all the wisdom of the world, all the power of the world, and the knowledge of who he is. He gave up his memory, having predetermined exactly what he would do in becoming humanity. In becoming humanity, God revealed who he is. He is made up of his son. Elohim is a plural word. And God descended and became fragmented, divided into the unnumbered sun. Each is God, buried in the skull of man. He awakens in the skull of man. He awakens individually. We do not awaken collectively. You are unique. No one can take your place. Salvation external to man is of no avail whatsoever. You can be the holiest of holies in the eyes of yourself and your friends. <coughs> that has nothing to do with it. You could be so good that you can't believe for one moment you could get better. That has nothing to do with it. You can go on diet, go to holy places, do all these things, that's nothing. <coughs> The final revelation is when the Son stands before you. And the Son is the resultant state of your journey to this world of death. This is a world of death. And God came down into death, buried in the skull of man, 
and overcomes death. And the result of his journey stands before him personified as a son, the eternal son. So in many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That son reveals you exactly who you are. You could be now the lady of ladies, unweighed, and never, I've never known a man. Makes no difference. In the resurrection, you are above the organization of sex, but you're not above fatherhood. And this son is not begotten of sex. He is the resultant state of your journey through the experiences of this world of death. So when Blake wrote in Jerusalem, how they come forth from the furnaces, these are the furnaces, and how long, how vast, how severe the anguish, ere they find their father, were long to tell. This is the anguish. This is the hell. For heaven is nothing more than the presence of the awakened God. And hell is his absence. While we sleep, we dream nightmares. And God is the dreamer in man. And this world that we think is the awaking world, this is a dream too. <clears throat> and here, this is God asleep. When God awakes in man, it's heaven. If as he awakes, everything within his presence is made perfect. That I know from my own experience. That heaven is not a realm. It is a character. It is a body. And clothed in that body, no matter where you are, everything is made perfect. If you walk through the petrified forest, it would suddenly bloom because you are present. If you were in the desert, it would bloom. Nothing can stand in your presence that is imperfect. I know that from an experience at sea in 1946. When I was risen from within, and when they all sang my praise, Neville is risen. And clothed in this glorious, luminous body, I walked by. And thousands waited for me to come. And they were all imperfect. Blind, lame, halt, withered, shrunken, you name it, there they were. I did not raise a finger to transform them. I had no compassion to transform them. I did not stop to do anything or to talk to one of them. I made no effort whatsoever, but clothed in the perfect body, as I glided by, every one was made perfect. Eyes that were missing came out of the nowhere and filled the empty socket. Arms that were missing came out of the nowhere and filled the empty shoulder. People who could not rise jumped for joy, and every one was made perfect and I didn't raise a finger to make it so. What made it so? I was in my body that is perfect. And everything has to be perfect in my presence. So I know heaven is nothing more than the presence of the risen God. And hell would be the opposite. When he is not risen, he dreams these strange dreams of death and decay. And whenever you are risen, and you will be, because he in you must awake. And when he awakes, you are clothed in your immortal body. And that is perfect. And you cannot be any place where it isn't perfect. If you went through hell, it will be instantly transformed into heaven. And heaven means harmony. Everything is made perfect, made right in your presence. 
So the final revelation is not going to be going to the sun or to the outside planet or finding more of the earth, marvelous as it is. <clears throat> For you and I enjoy the compass tonight, we have light. We found that right here on earth. How to do it? It was always there, but not discovered. You aren't going to discover anything that wasn't. It was always there. We have just unlocked the energy in the atom. It was always there. We had not discovered the means by which it could be unlocked. We never even believed it contains its power. All of a sudden, man discovers it can be unlocked. He devised the means to unlock it. And you and I enjoy all the marvelous things that man today is discovering on earth, as told us in that 19th Psalm. Not only the wonders of the heaven declaring the glory of God, but his firmament shows forth his handiwork. And here is his handiwork. And day after day, we come forward with something entirely different, something new, making it an easier world in which to live, as far as the burdens go. But the final revelation of God is in his Son. And that's the universal language that everyone can understand. Because if tonight I lived in Africa, but I knew the story, <clears throat> and I read the story, so I take only the Old Testament, for that's the story. And in the Old Testament, I read of a man. But as I read it, I think, well, now, he lived a thousand years ago, if I read it in the first century. For he's supposed to have lived a thousand B.C. Living today, I would say, now, he lived 3,000 years ago. So I don't associate myself with him at all. I was born and raised in the Christian faith. I call myself a Christian. I knew no other religion. I simply knew only what my mother taught me, what I learned in school, and I called myself a Christian. So I read the story, and mother would read me these stories, but they belonged to a world that was thousands of years ago. And these men died, as far as I'm concerned, that was secular history, and they were of the past. Then all of a sudden, one night, here in Beverly Hills, sound asleep, my skull explodes and standing before me as it explodes and I am sitting at a table and before me is David and there is no uncertainty as to who he is. He is not a David, he is the David. He is the David of biblical fame and he stands before me and I know exactly who he is and he knows who I am. And before him is the severed head of the giant Goliath, right on a table before me. And there he is leaning against the side of an open door. And I am looking at him. And I know I am his father. And he knows that he is my son. And here is this perfectly marvelous thing. 3,000 years went by, did it. And here it is contemporary. Then what happened? My memory returned. Memory returned. All that I read in Scripture was all about me, and I didn't know it. As told us in the 40th Psalm, in the volume of the book, it is all about me. But when you read it, don't think a man called David or one called Jesus is reading that book. Think of yourself, for Jesus is the I am of man. That's God. Jesus is the Lord. He is buried in every man. And in the story, David calls him my Lord, which is the name referred to of the Father. Every son spoke of his father as my Lord. So you read the 40th Psalm, and because it was written a thousand B.C., you think, well, no, I'm not related. How could I be re related to these characters of the Old Testament and they were all Jews? And I call myself a Christian. And here is the only reality. I am the father of this great Jew called David. 
therefore I must be Jesse. And yet I had no change of identity. Then I look up the word Jesse, and it means Jehovah. It means the Lord. It means a self-existent being. That's what the word Jesse means. And Jesse is the father of David. And suddenly I am aware memory has returned. So the only thing that you gave up in your descent into this world was memory. And completely forgot who you are. That you may experience death and not pretend that you are man. You could not actually accomplish the adventure if you pretended. An actor steps up on the stage and he plays his part. But he knows after that curtain comes down and the final curtain comes down, he is going to go home to his lovely home. If he has a lovely home. If he's a great star who has made money, he goes home to a fabulous home. Or, but that's not the story. You have to completely forget that you are God to become man. And you have completely forgotten that you are God in becoming man. But all day long you call upon his name, and his name is your name. You say, I am. So who are you? And before you answer anything, you say, well, I am. And then you say, John so-and-so. I am Dr. So-and-so. But you precede it with, I am, and that's God's name. But you don't know who you are until the very last of the journey, and that last is when his son comes into your world, and his son is your son, and then memory returns. And now you know that every child born of woman is the same being, it's God buried there. And everyone is going to have the identical son, not another David, and therefore we are one, as told us in Scripture. I dwell in them, and they dwell in me, and we are one. So you are now different, and you call yourself by another name. You will not lose your identity, and yet you and I are one, because we have the same son. Together, collectively, we all form the father. And the father only has the son. And that son is David. So you will not lose your identity, but you and I are one. Having the same son, we are the same father. So the father is a compound unity. The word is Elohim, one made up of others. And the others, we are the others. And the others are called in Scripture the sons of God. So the sons came down, but the sons formed the Father. Now we are awakening individually as God the Father. That's raising us to a higher level than we were when we descended. That is the adventure. And God is in this adventure. He's not on the outside of it. He is in it. And he's in it where? He's buried. He's buried in his holy sepulchre. The holy of holies, and that is your skull. That's where God is buried. Buried in his tomb. And so naturally it is empty when they find it. So this world is a copy. It's a shadow world. Make everything according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. And so it has to be perfect. So here at the very end, you see the Son, and the Son reveals the Father. Everyone in this world is going to have that experience. I promise you, because I know it happened to me so suddenly, so unexpectedly, it's going to happen to everyone. Not one can fail. So here, in these closing nights, I thought I was going to be tired altogether and show you the important things of Scripture. That the Old Testament is a recorded shadowland. I call it an adumbration, a foreshadowing, in a not altogether conclusive or immediately evident way. But when it happens, then 
the whole thing unfolds within you. As we are told, this is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown into our heart and given us the very light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Christ is David. Here is the glory in the face of Christ. So when Browning brings it out in his beautiful poem, and he has Christ speak to sleeping God, called in the scripture, Saul. And Saul is simply God sung to sleep, and he is called a mad person. Well, if he's sung to sleep, he has strange dreams. And David stands before Saul, and he said, Oh, Saul, a face like my face shall receive thee. A man like unto me thou shalt love, and be loved by forever. A hand like this hand shall throw open the gates of new life to thee. Then he stands before him and he states, See, the Christ stands. This is Brandon's poem. When David, and it was all inspired by the 16th and 17th chapters of the first book of Samuel. And David stands before the demented king and reveals who he is. But the king could not see it. When he stands before you, you'll know it. You'll be completely awake and you'll know that you are God the Father. You could have all the children in the world in this world of death. It makes no difference. You could be barren or you could have many. It's marvelous if you are a father or a mother, but you are destined to have the son. And the Son is only the resultant state. When you've played all the thoughts, you too will say, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. Now return unto me the glory that was mine, the glory that I had with thee before that the world was. He's not asking for anything else other than the return of that glory, and glory and God are synonymous terms in Scripture. Return my Godhead. I gave it up. I gave up my memory to become man. And now return it all unto me. And then you will say, I have finished the race. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. And everyone will be crowned with righteousness. And what is righteousness? In Scripture, when man completes the condition imposed upon him by a relationship, he is accounted righteous. And that relationship is Father Son. The minute it happens to you, you are the righteous being. And therefore you wear the crown of righteousness. No mortal eye can see it. But it is seen, it's only the crown, it's not a crown. And Paul used these words in his letter to Timothy. He spoke of the crown, not an indefinite article, but the definite one. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. He finished it. For he said, now I bear on my body the mark of Jesus. And one thinks it means the great mark that the world will paint on a picture. No. The marks you have done are the stories I have told you concerning how it unfolds within you. First, you awaken. Then you come out and you are born from above. Then you discover the Son, who reveals you as God the Father. Then your body is split 
in two from top to bottom. And then you take the blood, that golden liquid light at the base of your spine, and then you fuse with it, and like a fiery serpent, you are sending into your skull, are taking with you the blood through the curtain, for you are the temple of the living God, and the only curtain that is split is split not in some little thing made by human hands, but your own body is split in two. That's the curtain. And so now you make a new and living way into the Holy of Holies. And that Holy of Holies, it was empty when you came out. And you go back now, and you're the only living reality in it. And all of those who preceded you, and those who will come together, you'll form one being. One infinite being that is God the Father. And then your final state is when the Holy Spirit descends upon you in bodily form as a doubt. That is the seal of approval of the work being completed. And then you tell the story, as I'm telling it to you now. You tell it to anyone who will listen, in the hope that they will listen and believe it. For it is destined that they will experience it. But no one can really understand and appreciate Scripture until he has experienced Scripture. You have no idea how altogether wonderful it is until you've experienced it. The thrill that was mine when this thing happened with David. I jumped out of my bed and I wrote it down. It was early in the morning. My wife was sound asleep and I didn't want to wake her. And the next morning when I told her, I said, you may not believe this, but do you know I am the father of David? Well, she loves all the things that I have in my vision, and she never ridicules or makes little of anything I tell her. And it struck her forcibly. But I said, yes, honestly, I am David's father. But at the moment, believing it to be secular history, my wife would think to me, is this now a memory of the past? Going back 3,000 years ago, you lived, and you were the man called, in Scripture, Jesse. Then in time, it all unfolded. The meaning of Jesse, Jesse means Jehovah. And yet here I am, limited in this world, restricted by the body that I wear, imprisoned by this body, and continue to be in prison to the very end, when I take it off for the last time. This time when I take it off, I am not re-imprisoned as all who have not had the experience will be. For all who have not had the experience will be restored to life in a body just like this, only young and healthy and nothing missing. Perfect, about 20 years of age, to continue the journey until that last revelation. All the revelations in the world, marvelous as they are, they must wait to the end. And the end is when he reveals himself in the Son. So we are told, set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ in you. The unveiling of Jesus Christ in you is the unveiling of the Father and the Son. Jesus is the Father. He who has seen me, said Jesus, has seen the Father. And the Son is David who calls him, my Lord. And so when that whole thing is unveiled within man, then he knows who he is. And everyone came here for that one purpose to give up completely and overcome death. For the last enemy to, to be overcome is death. Really nothing dies anyway. For all are restored. Everything is restored by these eternal images that are forever in heaven. And they re are restored by contemplating the image. But that doesn't mean the end. That's only restoration. Resurrection is something entirely different. That comes at the end. And after the resurrection, which is the awakening within the skull, comes the birth from above. Then the discovery of David, 
then the splitting of the temple, and then the descent of the dove. And these are the marks of Jesus upon the body that Paul said, I bear upon my body the marks of Jesus. He did not spell them out. I am making every effort to spell them out and to give you the actual interval of time between these marks that you may check it. It took me 1260 days. Or you can say three and a half months or three and a half years, pardon me, or 42 months. These names are all in Scripture. 42 months, three and a half years, or time, times, and half a time, or 1260 days. It takes exactly 1260 days. From the, 20, from the 20th day of July of 1959 to the first day of January of 1963 comes to 1260 days. And that was the interval in which the whole thing happened. Other visions came after that, but they are not considered the mark. These are the marks that took 1260 days. Now here, because we are at almost the end of the journey, let us go into the silence and give you a longer time tonight to ask questions if you feel like it. And let us go. Good. No, are there any questions, please? Yes, ma'am. What is it when you have a dream or even a vision? Do you not understand it to be when its whole purpose is to reveal God within it? Did you all hear that question? Why when we have a dream, I wouldn't say all dreams are of that nature. Most of them are symbolic granted. But the lady wants to know why is it that if they are supposed to instruct us, why are they so difficult for the individual who had the dream to understand them? Well, I must confess that man is a past master at misinterpreting his dream. He tries to read everything into it, and it only has one central jet of truth. But he tries to give every little piece of the dream significance, and it doesn't have that. But we are told in the book of Numbers, the 12th chapter of Numbers, I will speak to man in a dream and make myself known in a vision. He reveals himself in vision, but he speaks in a dream. And some dreams are so simple they need no interpretation. Others need interpretation, as we are told in the 41st chapter of Genesis, when Pharaoh could not interpret his own dreams, and the wise men could not interpret it for him. Then he took Joseph, and Joseph came and interpreted the dream, and as he said, so it came to pass. He understood the universal language of symbolism. And so all I can say to you is, well, make an effort, try your best, or ask someone that you trust who can interpret the dream. But don't try to read everything into a dream. Some are very simple. Others that seem simple may have a tremendous significance using the symbolism of the dream. If you want help in a book, don't buy these dream books. They are no earthly good. But there is a book 
put out today in one volume. I have it in two when it first came out. It's called The Language, The Lost Language of Symbolism by Bailey. And he shows you through the centuries, going back to pre-Christian days, the imagery that the Egyptians used and all civilizations prior. And it's a universal language. The animal world and what it means when encountered in a dream and it's called the lost language of symbolism because it's universal a man in china could dream of a dog they have dogs we dream of a dog we have dogs so it's not necessarily a dog an animal it has certain significance and the actions of the dog we all have horses, but everybody has a horse in the world. That is, all nations have horses. And if we do not have tigers in our land, we know what a tiger is like. And all these things are part of this one volume today, and it's a perfectly wonderful volume. It might help you in interpreting your dream. But he does speak to man in dream, and he makes himself known in a vision. Your vision is just like this, you know, just as real as this. Where man is in control. Although he's automatically doing all the things, he seems to be in control of what is happening. And yet it's unfolding rapidly, but just like this. Well, let me, did you hear that question? If you were here last lecture night, you would understand the question better. For we spoke on a different level altogether. We spoke of the impregnation, and using the story of a lady who is present tonight, where she saw me standing at the foot of her bed with my back to her. And then I was sitting on her bed and then I leaned backwards, and my entire body sank into her body. And here she is alone, and yet I am within her. And then I came up by the side of her, and then I took my left hand and covered her body with my left hand and felt the body, and then instantly I am on her. And then she had a climax, an ecstatic orgasm. And then I disappeared. And she got off the bed, hoping to stand, and she fell to her knees. Then she wondered what was that experience. Well, I explained it last lecture night, that that was an impregnation, that the remnant spoken of in Scripture is not a remnant of a certain race of people, but the elect of God. They are the apostles. The apostles are called, they are elected, they are chosen. But the word apostle means to be sent. And so when you are called, you're also sent. Then you are sent in the capacity of one to sow the seed. Not everyone sows the seed. Any more than when you have race horses. If you're going to breed horses, you don't take every stud because he's a stud and use him as a stud. We have chosen ones that we use as studs. And you bring your mares to be folded by a certain stud. Well, the same, this is a, a copy world. That same world takes place above. And the apostle is simply the call, the chosen. They are the chosen stallions who will plant the seed. They are totally unaware because they also have their own moral ethical code on this world by which they live. And if they were called upon to perform such acts in the knowledge of what they're doing, they couldn't do it and would not do it because it would be in conflict with their ethical moral code. So they are relieved of the memory of it. 
So it is said of them, he came to do the Father's will. And then the Father speaks, as I have found in him one after my own heart, who will do all my will. So it's the Father's will that that seed be planted at this moment, now, there, there, there. And the chosen ones, called the apostles, they plant the seed. Not everyone is going to be chosen to plant the seed. They are eight ranks in the heavenly structure. The apostles come first. Then the prophets. Then the teachers. So you have a complete rank as you have in the army. And what comes down from the supreme general goes down to the next and the next and the next. And finally you get the soldier without stripes. But it's all in rank. So the apostles in all the divisions, no matter where you read in scripture, they come first, but not everyone is.